Do you ever struggle with trying to be perfect, believing that everyone else has it all together? Our guests, Ginger Stocky and Aaron Cluley from Joyce Meyer's Talk It Out podcast are two imperfect people who say it's okay, Pastor Jay, to have flaws. That's right, it is all right. And men, I'm talking to you, you're going to find out what biblical masculinity is all about with Better Man CEO, Dr. Chris Harper. He's going to share what it takes to be a better man so you better stay tuned because Unscripted Faith starts right now. Unscripted Faith, we have an awesome program today. I'm excited to sit down and have some conversation. I am excited as well. We've got some ladies things. Yes. We've got some men's things. We, sure we got do. a little something for everybody, so it's going to be great. Yeah, it is. It's going to be great. Listen, here on Unscripted Faith, we like to be real and authentic. But let's face it, life is imperfect, and neither are we. Believe it or not. <laughs> Speak for yourself, but that's all right. I'm working on it. Our next guests know all about the challenges of life, and they aren't afraid to talk about them. In Joyce Meyer's Talk It Out podcast that they host. Ginger and Aaron, welcome to Unscripted Faith. Hi, thank Hi. you. Thanks for having us. Well, first, let me just start off to say we are so honored to have you, and uh, we are so thankful for what you guys also bring to Joyce Myers Ministry. Obviously, everybody's thankful for Joyce Myers, but yeah. it's ladies like y'all that help that motor keep moving. And so we know that you guys bring a lot to the platform, and so we just want to jump right in because, you know, in this day and hour, transparency, uh, being honest and open about where we are is a very difficult thing for a lot of people. Where have you seen as ladies, and either one of you can go first, Ginger, if you want, you can go first. Where have you seen where it's been difficult for you, but that as you've applied it, God has helped you to grow and develop? I think one of the things as, as you grow older as a Christian, you tend to think by this point, I should have it all figured out, mm -hmm. right? So I don't want people to see all the things that I'm still struggling with and all of the flaws and let alone to say out loud some of the questions yeah. that I'm having about God or even about faith doesn't mean you don't love God anymore. It just means you're searching. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're kindred spirits with you guys, unscripted faith. You know, that's, that's what this whole life with Christ is about. It It's unscripted and we're, we're walking and getting closer to him, but we love being able to just encourage people that that's okay. That's what it's all about. We all have those things. Yeah, it's very true. When we first started the podcast, it's been about five years, which is hard to believe. But I remember coming into it when we first started with a lot of anxiety. And I hadn't shared that with anybody because I thought, I am a Christian and I love Jesus. So I sh this should not be a thing that I have to deal with. Uh, but when we started talking about the things that we were struggling with and just being real honest about, hey, I love God, and I'm also having a really hard time with my thoughts and being a mom and juggling it all and getting really anxious, to be able to say that to my friends and then also hear from other people say, I am having the same problem. How can we figure this out? How can we come to God together? And what, what are some practical things we can do has been a really, it's changed me for sure. And it's encouraging mm -hmm. to hear other people say the same kind of thing. Wow. Well, I love that. And you kind of are hinting at community, the sense of community. How do you all effectively achieve a community that is authentic and open? I think those are those are two words that are that are separate, but have to go together. Right. Mm -hmm. If if we can't be authentic and just completely be ourselves without any fear of being judged. Yeah by the people who are around us in our community. And then also going going further than that, but being really open. I mean, we we are so open about things. So open. That sometimes people are like, wow, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know if, if you should be talking about that. But it's important and we're living these things. So being able to talk about things mm -hmm. like anxiety or being impacted by pornography mm -hmm. or fear, um, questions of faith, doubting God, and we're not hearing enough about those things all yeah. the time. So I think, I think as women especially, you know, we need good friends, we need trusted relationships, and we need a closer, a closer walk with Christ. Yeah, yeah, that's good. 
You know, Aaron, one of the things I was going to ask you, you mentioned about anxiety when you started the podcast. Can you go a little bit deeper into what that anxiety is? Was it about the show? Was it everything in general? What was it that you were battling with at that time? I would say it, it started after I had my first child, and then I had a second one shortly after. And so the culmination of that, and then we moved to so some personal stuff in my own life. Um, it just got to be so much that I would find myself really anxious before we would record. Like, what if something happens with my kids and I can't make it in and I can't record? Or just little things would cause me to get really anxious. And so it cont it felt like it got worse. And even though I, like, I know what I'm supposed to do as a Christian, like, I know to read my Bible, but it just, it got so stuck in my head and it felt like I would just keep playing the script over and over and it made it worse. And so to have someone to talk it out loud with and say, wait a second, this is not true. This is not what the Bible says. This is not who I am. I'm not an anxious person. I might struggle with anxiety, but that's not who God says I am. I think that's why this community has been so important because we can remind ourselves, these are the things, these are the truths of what God's word says about me. Mm -hmm. These other things that I'm believing are lies. And so as a group of people to come together and say, here's what God says, Here's what the enemy says, and we're going to focus on what God mm -hmm. says and then do that together as a group. I think it's been, it's been really impactful. And what we see in each other. Oh, huge. I encouraging yeah. each other as, as a team, you yeah. know, along with Joyce and, and even the comments that we get is, is just letting people know it's okay to yeah. deal with issues. Mm -hmm. It's okay to ask these questions, mm -hmm. but we stand on the truth of God's word. Yeah. The reason why I asked that is because um, I was just sharing this past weekend. I was talking to some people and even from our pulpit, and I was talking about how when I first started ministering about 25 years ago, um, I used to have to have people pray me out of my, uh, my office to get into the pulpit. When I got there, it was great, but I battled so hard and people were so yeah. blessed by the transparency because they yeah. look at me now and now I'm on television and speaking in front of thousands of people and things on that line. And they're like, Oh my gosh, I mean, there were times where literally I, I had to have my mom come down, wow. pray yep. me out of my office just to get to the pulpit. Now, when I got there, I never had any bad experiences. It was just carrying the new weight of that. And sometimes when we're yeah. stepping into new things yeah. and we're doing things we've never done before, it's really hard. And so let me ask you this question. Yep. When you face those anxieties, when you face those things and you're doing those things, how do we get through that? How do we mm. press through those times? For me, and I learned a lot of this from Joyce, is that it's that do it afraid. Do it and afraid. so if I know, like, for example, like what you're talking about, I know I'm called to do this thing. Even though I'm facing a lot of anxiety right now, I know this is what God has called me to do. It is me taking a step, and I'm, I'm saying those scripture verses I know. God did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Um, I'm not anxious, but I'm thankful with that Philippians verse. If I'm saying those things and I'm, I'm stepping through my anxiety, then it's taking that step and doing it afraid. And then I, I know from experience, I can look back and see when I was anxious that one time and I did it, God met me That's where right. I was yeah. and I was yes. able to do that thing I was so scared of. And so he's going to do it again. So kind of remembering what my history is with God, doing it again and seeing, I know he's going to meet me there where I am. And it, I might feel scared. I might feel really anxious. My, my, I might have a panic attack, but I know he's faithful. And I know on the other side, I'm going to make it. And he's going to be with me and he's going to walk me through it. I think that's how I, I have gotten through it. Yeah. And pastor, I love that you shared that. Yeah. It's huge. I mean, how, how did you get through it? Well, you know, it's funny. I was, when I was teaching on this, I talked about Jesus said his soul was exceedingly sorrowful when he went to Gethsemane. He did mm -hmm. two things in there. He prayed and he pressed. And I think that's the big key that I have found out is that even as you mentioned, Aaron, you have to do it afraid. Yeah. And a lot of times yeah. people don't understand that even we as ministers, we have to do things afraid. A lot of times it's hard. It's not yeah. easy to step out in faith. But as you go to yeah. your point, Aaron, the more that we step out, you get a track record and God will never yeah. leave you. He's always by your side and he'll bring yeah. you through it. Come on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, in the Bible, when it talks about when um, I think it was Jesus and I think Little John, you know, we watch The Chosen. But they have that whole conversation about how, God, can you heal me? And God uses that, um, that issue that he has to keep him close to God. And I've, I've had this conversation with the Lord quite a bit. Like, even though I hate the fact that sometimes I still deal with anxiety, that always draws me so close to God. And it keeps the Holy Spirit so present in my life because I know anything I do is dependent upon him. And it's not my own strength. It is solely because I know that is God giving me what I need in that moment. And so it it just continues to draw me back to him, like you were saying. Mm. Yes, I love that. So last question, what is God saying in this current season right now? 
Oh, so many things, so you many know? Things. It's so interesting to me how guy can be saying so many things and be so quiet sometimes. <laughs> At That's the so same true. time, you know, I think he's he's talking to all of us, but to me, a lot about trust mm -hmm. is yeah. just just trust me. If I can just trust him in all of it, mm -hmm. so many of those fears and those questions and doubts are are alleviated because not because I have the answers, yeah. but because he does. Mm -hmm. So there's silence in not having the answers, but he's talking to me about trust. Yeah, I think that's wow. wonderful. Wow. That, that is, is so good. 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 Yeah, that's a powerful word. We all could glean from more trust in Jesus. Ladies, thank you so thank much you so for much. what you're doing yes. for your ministry that is drawing others into more authentic relationship with Jesus and truly with Holy Spirit. Thank you for who you are. Oh, it's an honor. Thank you so much. It's been great being able to, to talk with you guys. We love it. Thanks Please for come having back us. Anytime. Come yes. back anytime. <laughs> Well, it's now time to find out what chapter in the book of Acts that Tom is going to take us through on this week's Spirit Walk. Let's take a look. Last time on Spirit Walk, we talked about opposition and that there was opposition and the disciples experienced imprisonment and beating and all kinds of things as they just proclaimed the good news of Jesus. You know, they're, they were still speaking. They weren't going to allow themselves to stop. In fact, Peter said, you judge yourself whether we should listen to man or listen to God. So they continued to speak the, the words of this life, the words of the good news. So what happened? Well, they had a very special thing happen in ver verse 31 of Acts chapter 4. Let me read it to you. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now listen, they were filled with the Holy Spirit just a couple of chapters ago. Why did they need to be filled again? Well, there's an old saying among uh, Pentecostal Christians that I'm filled with the Spirit, but I leak. And that's true. I've found that to be true myself, that even though we're baptized, we're filled to fullness, to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Yes, we leak. And when we leak, we need to be refilled. And so they were praying. They were seeking God, all the things we know we should do. And as they did that, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just like at the beginning. It fell on them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And what did they do? Did they have a great meeting? Well, I'm sure they did, but they did something else. They went out and preached the gospel. That's what it says, that they went out and boldly spoke the gospel to the people around them. This is what the book of Acts is all about. It's all about us taking the time, taking that, that time with God, and then taking seriously his commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So they continued to speak, and they continued to see people added to the kingdom. So for you and I, what are we going to do? Well, you know what? Let's seek God. Let's seek God, and let's have him fill us again. Like, yes, Lord. Oh, my goodness, Lord, I need you. I need you today. I need you to fill me to a, a new level of fullness that I might be able to boldly speak because we're going to receive that opposition too. Again, as I said last time, you're probably not going to be arrested. Who knows? Maybe you will be, but you're probably not going to be. But you may be laughed at. You may be ridiculed. You may, uh, you know, even suffer something else, you know, from that preaching of the gospel. But as you ask him, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit, he's going to do that. And he's going to give you the power to walk in the Spirit and to share his love. Welcome back to Unscripted Faith. And I love that Tom was sharing with us, Jay, how to face opposition, no matter what it is, that one call to Jesus, yeah. he will fill us and empower us and equip us. That's so true. And, you know, you think about even coming up with what we're about to talk about, dealing with men, yes. you know, how we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, men, yes. we got to ask you this question. Yes. Do you know what your identity is in Christ? Because in today's society, the definition of manhood and masculinity has been quite skewed. But here to clear things up, it's Better Man's chief storyteller and CEO, Dr. Chris Harper. Dr. Chris, so good to have you on Unscripted Faith. My friend, so good to be here with you guys this morning. And yeah, just honored. All the way from Texas. <laughs> Come on, all the way from the great state of Texas. What do they say? The star, is that, do they still sing that song? The stars are bright, they're big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas. Isn't that like one of the songs down there? 
<laughs> every day. <laughs> well, hey, let's get right into it. We're so glad to have you. You know, you're hearing what Tom just mentioned on Spirit Walk. Um, masculinity is under attack. You as a man, what do you feel the biggest battle for you being a man is in the, in the year 2024? Yeah, such a, such a powerful question. We have a, we have a saying that anything that's not rightly understood or rightly defined will inevitably be abused. Mm. The thing will be abused. And, and today we're seeing an abuse of what manhood and masculinity is. It's not, when you think about men's ministry uh, in the 90s, kind of the height of men's ministry, the, the enemy was passivity. You had men fighting passivity. But what's happened over the last 35 years is we had a generation of young men grow up uh, 41% without physical fathers, uh, the majority without spiritual fathers. So the battle today is against ignorance. It's, it's no longer uh, good men and bad men. Let's make all the bad men good men. It's good men and men who want to be good. They just don't know how. They've, they've not been shown the way. They've not been giving uh, a definition and direction. Well, Chris, how did we lose that? Uh, how did we lose that? We got men, like you said, early in the 90s. I remember the whole Promise Keepers movement and all of those things that came through. I came through, that was like 17, 18 years old throughout that time. But how did we get to this point? What, where did we miss it and where did we drop the ball that now we've got men that don't know how to be men? Or is it that we don't know what a man is anymore? Yeah, that's such a good question. So in the 1970s, predominant culture said, I don't need a man. In the 1990s, culture said, I don't want a man. And here we are in 2024 asking, what is a man? Wow. That's, that's where wow. we've come in, in, in 60 years. And then what happened inside the church was interesting. Uh, we shifted in the 80s and 90s. We shifted from academic settings, think Sunday school, into small group communal settings, which, which those things are important. But when we did that, we began to segregate everybody by age and stage. We put all the unmarried people over here, and then we put all the married people over there. We put the 20-year-olds, you know, in the back of the room, and we put the 70-year-olds in the front of the room. And what we did was we killed multi-generational discipleship. We thought by putting a bunch of 20-year-olds together, wisdom and experience would just bloom. But that's not, that's not how wow, wisdom and experience um, um, happens. It's largely transferred down through the generations. And one of the biggest gaps inside the church today is multi-generational discipleship, where you have, you have the men of one generation passing down the histories, passing down the traditions, passing down the definition of what it means to be God's man to the next generation. We have a Judges 2 problem. Judges 1, you had Joshua and the men of his generation. Uh, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. Judges 2 begins with Joshua and the men of his generation passed, and there arose a new generation who did not know God nor the things that God had done, and they did what was ever right in their own eyes. There wasn't a transfer of faith, and we're seeing that Judges 2 phenomenon play out today. Wow. So, Dr. Chris, what's the answer? How do we fix this problem? <laughs> That's so good. So, so men today need two things. They need clarity and they need community. So first, they need clarity around what it means to be God's man, a real man. Uh, that's where Better Man's been helpful. We kind of put a flag in the ground and said, hey, uh, this, is, this is God's definition, right? We're not redefining it. Uh, we don't have to. God gave us the picture of the perfect man and his son, King Jesus. We just have to look to him. We have to look to his word. So uh, we provide a clear definition of what it means to be a man in the 21st century. We call it the four W's. A real man courageously follows God's word. A real man loves and serves and honors, protects God's woman. A real man excels at the work God has given him. And a real man betters God's world through his children, his church, and his community. Word, woman, work, world. Super simple, super sticky. So we give men that clarity, that definition, and then we do it in the context of community, small group life. You'll never, I don't care what new discipleship thing comes down the pipe, you will never out strategize six guys sitting around a fire, six guys sitting around a table. 
six, seven guys in a locker room. So, so we bring these guys together six to eight men at a time, typically with an older man leading the group, facilitating the group, speaking with younger men, and we give men the community that they're looking for. Uh, the Surgeon General of the U.S. just announced that the number one killer of men it's not heart disease, it's not cancer, it's loneliness and isolation. Wow. So, so when you give men clarity and when you give men community, they can become the men that God has called them to be. Wow. You know, there's a movie that's out, I don't know if you've seen it, called The Forge. Uh -uh. Have, you seen it? Have you seen it yet, Dr. Chris? Absolutely, we phenomenal had, I mean, movie. I had an opportunity to interview Alex here on this show and uh, it was outstanding. I went and saw it, it's an outstanding wow. about that generational transference of discipleship, which I think is really insightful on your part. But you know, one of the questions that I have for you is with, you mentioned about the covering the woman. You know, you hear so much talk about misogyny, you hear so much talk about uh, women's rise to power. I believe that's an attack on the men and it's causing men to be, uh, to have a lack of courage to stand up. It's almost like that Jezebel spirit and you've got Ahab's that are trying to lead but are terrified to do that. I feel that pressure over the men. What do you say about that? Yeah, I, it's it's demonic, that that idea that misogyny and it's, um, you know, uh, stereotypical of men that, that they want to, that type A, red pill, hyper alpha masculinity, um, that's demonic. That's not the picture of Jesus. That's not the picture that uh, God paints of manhood and masculinity. Uh, Dallas Willard said it best. He said, he said, the definition of love is simply having somebody else's best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, yeah. so when I'm looking at my wife and when I'm looking at my daughter, when I'm looking at, you know, women in the office that I work with, my, my job as a man is to have their best interest at heart. How do I live and move and serve in such a way that elevates them and honors them? and respects them, right? I, I, I teach my boys, I have three boys, and um, I tell my boys all the time, I want you to have enough courage and enough integrity that, that when a woman denies one of your advances, you still have the courage to walk her home at night. That's good. Wow. Right, right, so that type of, yeah. that type of um, servant leadership, you know, that, that, hyper, that hyper alpha masculinity is, is all about the individual, what can I do to better myself? What can I do to get mine? What can I do to advance? Christ-like masculinity is all about others. How can I live, move, talk, breathe in such a way uh, that I truly, Philippians 2, 3, consider others, women included, more important than myself? That's what a real man does. So good. Amen, amen. Well, listen, we've got about a minute left. Uh, what is the number one way that men can defeat what's coming up against us and be the man that God's called them to be in this hour. Yeah, yeah, so good. So I would, I would talk to the leaders of men, those, those men that have influence over other men, uh, what, what young men today are looking for, and, and I'll package it real quick for you kind of historically. So three generations ago, uh, men were asking, um, is Christianity true? right? Is it true? Two generations ago, uh, they, were, they were asking, is it efficient? You know, is it easy? You had that whole easy believism, seeker sensitive movement. Yeah. Today, young men are asking, does Christianity work? Does it work, man? They're looking for something that works and is super practical in their life. So my encouragement to these leaders of men is display a Jesus that works, that produces faith, hope, and love, that can draw and win young men in. So men need evidence. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Such a blessing. Thank you for your ministry and your insightful uh, just commentary on what's happening with men. And uh, we're praying for you that God will continue to promote what it is that you're doing. Come by on Script of Faith anytime. Hey, thank you so much. Honor to be with you guys today. Well, if you've enjoyed that, now my favorite part is coming up. We get a chance to share a little bit of our commentary of what God is saying to men and also how to deal with anxiety and fear and things along that line. God bless you. We'll be right back. God is doing a new thing. Be ready for it. With your best gift today, request Prophetic Reset, a powerful resource by prophetic leader and pastor Joshua Giles. 
you'll discover a 40-day journey unlike any other, one that will reposition you under God's powerful anointing, deepen your relationship with Him, and propel you forward. Through empowering scriptures, biblical insights, and prophetic tips, you'll discover how to reactivate your spiritual gifts and faith, release the old to seek Him anew, rest your mind in His counsel, and hear His wisdom for your next season. Even more, you'll witness His Word manifest in your life and return to His promises for you. Ask for Prophetic Reset when you give in support of Cornerstone Television today. Every gift helps us to spread the gospel through Christian programming. Call 888-665-4483 or give online at ctvn.org slash donate. Welcome back to Unscripted Faith. We have had some phenomenal conversations about anxiety with Joyce Myers, host of her podcast, and then just now with Dr. Chris. Jay, I have a question. Why is true manhood, okay, in this day and hour and masculinity frowned upon right now? Well, I think it's a demonic attack because everything starts with the man. If you take a look, when God created, it's, it's amazing though, when he created man, he created male and female yes. inside of the man. Then he took the woman out and then everything started though with the man. So the devil knows if I can pervert the seed, I can destroy or pervert how things are multiplied. Mm -hmm. Men initiate women response. So the attack upon masculinity is to stop men from yeah. being the leaders, not in regards to misogynistic, we're better than, yes. or, but the ability to initiate love, cultivate women and family in a way that causes them to grow and develop. So I think that's the reason why the attack is so hard upon the men, because if you can pervert the seed, you can pervert the harvest. Yeah, I think it's so important too. Like it doesn't, the, the empowerment of women does not necessitate the emasculating of men. Like, in fact, I would say it is proof that that type of empowering is not true empowerment. Right. When I am fully empowered and strong and know who I am, I shine a light on you and who you are and, and right. call you higher, you know? That's so right. I, I, I hate kind of what uh, the world has created, but it's the world. And so I love that men like Dr. Chris are being able to define what it yeah. should look like with men and women looking to each other and saying, hey, I esteem you more than I do myself. And you take a look at what Aaron and Ginger mentioned about yeah. dealing with anxiety and, you know, men have to do it afraid. Yeah, You know, we have to Absolutely. do it afraid. Being a man is not always easy. No. Uh, and, and ladies that are out there, I know I'm talking to the camera right now. If you got a man that's willing to lead, give them a break <laughs> because it's not easy being yes. men. You are the, think about it. Eve takes the fruit. Yep. She takes it, gives it to Adam, and God shows up to Adam. Why did he show up to Eve? <laughs> Why did he show up to Eve? Because he gave authority to the man. Mm -hmm. And the man has been willing to lay down his life and do what's necessary for his wife, for his children, or whatever it is. that. So we have to understand, it's not easy being a man, but we are called to do it. We are graced to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like uh, Ginger and Aaron said, you know, sometimes you got to do it afraid. But if you yeah. do it, God will be with you. He'll meet you. Always. And I think that, I think also, like, men, women, boys, girls, adults, there is always a sense of fear because we live in the world, you know, but whenever we arise and shine in who Christ has made us to be, that fear goes away and love fills it. He Amen. is love, right? <laughs> Amen. That's so true. That's so true. So listen, no matter what you're battling with, do it afraid today. God will be with you and your best days are still ahead. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.